Hey guys, welcome to part two in our productivity series, my uh, seven most helpful, most helpful for me, most important tips on uh, being productive and the things that have really helped me to grow my freelance art career over time. Last week was part one in the series and these aren't necessarily, I think you, you could do them out of order, but um, if you feel like this is something that you're struggling with, that this you're kind of new to the productivity game or productivity is a real challenge for you, I might go ahead and go back and watch that video. You could watch it after this one, but um, it definitely does have some good kind of groundwork. We talked about identifying, um, getting clear on the difference between a goal and an aspiration and why only having aspirations can actually end up being kind of counterproductive and demotivating. And then we talked about how to identify and, uh, and get past work through the things that are in your way, the things that get in the way of you achieving your goals. So those are kind of the foundational components. And uh, then today we're going to talk a bit more about um, breaking down big goals into bite-sized pieces so that you um, can tackle bigger projects. And then we're also going to talk about grouping together similar kinds of tasks across several different goals or projects. And uh, this is something that I am excited to talk about because it is super on my mind this month. This month alone, I am working on five different freelance illustration projects for a total of, I think, where did I put that number? A total of 34 different illustrations. <laughs> And some of them are really big, like the biggest I have ever worked on before in terms of like just pure size and complexity. So um, I have been feeling really in touch with these tips the last few days. This is my first week back in the studio in the new year. So um, I was deploying all of these tips, all of these tactics earlier in the week as I was breaking down my goals and figuring out how to um, stagger everything and structure it throughout the month. So if you want to know, um, if you do feel like you are um, you know, pretty good at tackling kind of one goal at a time, or maybe you've already tackled all the like freshman level goal stuff of, you know, identifying your goals and working around your impediments and all that. And, and now you're ready to, to get into your sophomore year and really learn how to um, work on more than one big goal at a time, this is going to be the video for you. So as I said, today we are building on last week's video of goal setting and roadblocks and moving into breaking down your goals into their pieces so you know how to um, tackle each component involved and then how to group them together and tackle them more effectively and efficiently. So let's go ahead and dive right into the first part, which is breaking down your goals. All right, so first things first, goals versus tactics. So a goal is the thing that you're aiming for. It's the big target with the, you know, that you want to shoot your arrow right into the center. It's the thing that you want to achieve, the specific thing, the specific measurable, achievable thing that you want to achieve. Um, that is your goal. And then you're going to use something called tactics to get to your goal. And a tactic, uh, at least the way that we're going to use this here, I'm, I'm, bar I'm pulling pretty heavily from stuff that I used, from tricks that I used, not tricks, things that I used tools, skills, skills that I had as a community organizer, things that were um, ideas that were pretty heavily used uh, when I was in that community. So um, we, we have our goal, we have our specific goal, but then we're also going to use different tactics to help us achieve the goal. So, you know, if you were, um, if your goal is, you know, let's stick with the thing we set with the target. If you're an archer, you might have different kinds of training regimens. You might have different ways of um, challenging yourself and working up to getting your goal of getting that arrow right in the target. So um, a tactic, sometimes we can get kind of confused between a goal and a tactic because a goal is really more the, the concrete thing that you want to get done, but the tactic is how you're going to do it. So another example, because I find examples super helpful, let's say your goal is to um, land your first pet portrait commission. Maybe you've been doing things in other areas but you you know really like drawing animals and you want to do you want to get your first pet portrait commission so that's something that is pretty specific and um, if you did watch last week's video and you're wondering well why is that different than working for Starbucks I think landing a pet portrait commission is a lot more easily in your control than 
uh, something like a really, really big kind of uh, lofty goal, like we're, well, not even lofty, but you get what I mean. It's, it's a lot more likely that you'll be able to find someone who wants to commission you to do a pet portrait than it is to say, you know, I want to do all of the portraits for, I don't know, what would like a big version of that be? Like, I want to do all the portraits for Petco, or I want to do the, the working for Starbucks version of pet portraits. So um, saying, yes, you want to land your first pet portrait commission, that's a pretty good, specific, measurable, achievable goal. So some different tactics that you might use to get there and things that would help you to target that goal and achieve that goal. You might first decide to increase the number of animals that you have in your online portfolio. So you might just start drawing more animals to begin with. Um, that's one tactic. You could also uh, do pet portraits for family and friends. Uh, that's another tactic. A related tactic would be doing pet portraits for maybe some online influencers, hoping that they would share them on their pages. Um, another tactic could be doing a collaboration. So maybe several different artists do um, pet portraits or maybe you collaborate with a lettering artist and you do the pet portrait and they do the lettering at the bottom. Um, some, some form of any of those would be uh, tactical approaches for achieving your goal of landing a pet portrait commission. So if you do have a goal in mind right now and you kind of want to work through this process as you're watching this video, um, pause and do what I just did. Do some brainstorming to come up with tactics, ways that you could um, achieve your goal, different things that you could try to help knock down that domino. And uh, once you have those, uh, if you have several like I did, if you have four or five like I did, choose one or two tactics initially to try. Uh, if this is a personal project, a self-initiated project, like coming up with, um, like trying to uh, land a pet portrait commission, uh, you will have to be coming up, generating, um, coming up with and generating all of this structure on your own. You're not going to be relying on a client for it. So that's why it's so important to do that process of brainstorming your tactics and then pick what you think are the two strongest tactics. And um, you could choose, you could decide that what's the strongest by which is the most likely to achieve your goal. And maybe if you don't know that, you could say, well, which one can I start on the easiest? I always, for me, I always prioritize what will get me moving first because there are so many problems, so many challenges, so many wonderful surprises that you won't tackle until you're moving forward. So if you spend too much time in this planning phase, you're never going to get going. So um, that would be my pick actually for choosing the strongest tactic is, all right, which is the one that I can just jump right into and start on right now? Um, and once you have that, maybe you're going to do one or two at a time, then you're going to want to break the tactic down even further into tasks, into things that you, concrete steps that you need to do to, uh, to actually perform that tactic. So if, again, if you watched last week's video, you'll know we talked about, you know, aspiration and then kind of carving out your goal from the aspiration and then your goal inside your goal, you're going to have these different tactics that are going to help you to achieve it. And then inside the tactics are the little individual tasks, aspiration, goal, tactic, tasks. So once you have your tactics chosen, um, spend some time and think through what is every single step that you need to get done to achieve that tactic. Going back to what we talked about in lesson one with the roadblocks, this is an area that I think a lot of people get stuck on. So maybe they come up with a goal, they come up with the, the tactic, but they uh, don't spend the time to actually truly think through what is every single step that's involved in this. Or they, you know, they just start working on the tactic and then start f getting frustrated and feeling like, wow, this is taking too long or why can't I achieve this quicker? Um, and having a hard time maybe even like planning their time effectively because they haven't actually thought through all the things, all the steps that are involved in getting that tactic done. And uh, if you're resistant to writing them down because you feel like, oh, I don't actually like this is going to feel like too much or it's going to be demotivating. Um, it is, the, the, at least for me, it's the opposite. And I felt like that too. I didn't want to like get too granular with things because I just always was pretty resistant to anything that felt like restrictive and uh, coming up with a, a super concrete list, even that has the, the littlest nitty gritty things written down on it is actually going to motivate you to, um, to get those things done. They're even like little micro goals. So each one of those things that you check off is going to make you feel better about yourself and feel more competent and more like you can tackle whatever's coming next. So if we're looking at our uh, example of the pet portraits, let's say you decided that your first tactic is going to be to draw pet portraits for friends and family. So don't just put draw pet portraits for friends and family on your to-do list. Put, you know, be even more specific than that. Put like draw five pet portraits for friends and family. And then underneath that, you're going to write down all of the things, all the tasks, 
tasks that have to happen. So um, number one might be number one might be texting or calling or emailing, however you want to communicate, getting a hold of your family and friends to ask them if uh, if you could draw one of their pets, to ask them if they could participate. Then you'll want to uh, also gather and organize any reference photos that you're getting from from friends and family to um, to work from for this project. Then you're gonna have to make your sketches, then you'll probably show them your sketches, then maybe you'll adjust your sketches. Each of these should be a task on your to-do list. So for me, on my to-do list, I tend to have um, you know, I don't, I don't usually have a, uh, a goal on my to-do list. A goal might be in like a big planning document that I have. Uh, we'll talk about that kind of stuff later too. Um, but the things that are on my to-do list usually are tactics and then tasks or uh, tasks and then subtasks. So uh, you can see just with this one idea, we've already gotten several subtasks out of it. Then of course, you're going to have to actually do the, the full color sketches, then do any adjustments to the color sketches. Um, if you're working in traditional media, you'll have to scan them in and edit them. Then and show them again to the friends and family. Um, then you'll have to prep those files and export them for social media. You'll have to write your captions, do your hashtag research, all of that. Um, and then of course, posting itself. So saying pet portraits for friends and family, that's uh, that may feel like a, a specific enough thing, but giving yourself all of the, the steps that are involved, you're, you're basically taking out the, the thinking process. So when it does come time to actual, actually execute it, actually do this thing, you don't have to expend any mental energy figuring out, all right, what do I need to do next? You already know what you need to do next. One quick note I will mention here um, is uh, related to goals versus tasks when it comes to client projects. So if you are working for a client and you have the brief and you know what the client wants from you, your goal is already pretty self-explanatory. You're going, your goal is delivering the deliverables <laughs> to the client. So you already know concretely what you need to do. So in that case, you can skip the tactical breakdown. You don't need to think through, okay, well, what are all the different ways that I can topple that domino? What are all the different ways that I can achieve that goal? Because you you have such a, you have such a specific clear aim already and it's fully in your control whether or not you need to execute it. Um, so uh, whether or not you'll be able to execute it. So at that point, if I have a, a client project, um, when I have a client project, I don't do the whole like tactical breakdown. I only do the tactical breakdown if it's a self-initiated project, something that I am, um, if I'm trying to break into a new market or, or work on a new kind of um, skill, a new kind of illustration, um, that's when I do tactical breakdown. But if I'm just working on a client project, I'll, I'll go right from the, you know, identifying the clear goal to breaking out the tasks that are involved. Um, and those tasks would look very similar to what I just listed out. So it would be like the gathering the reference photos, doing the sketches, sending the sketches, amending the sketches, doing the color, sending the color, amending the color. They'd be all, all of those different components involved. All right, so moving on to the next uh, topic for today's video, uh, which is tip number four in this series of seven, and that is grouping together similar tasks. So once you have gone through the process of breaking out your, your tactics or your, um, your client projects into the different components, all the different things that need to happen to, um, to get that goal accomplished, to, to check off that checklist, you can start grouping together similar tasks. So, you know, for me, what this might look like, what it does look like <laughs> this month, I can say uh, very concretely with working on five different projects is that I have have grouped together um, the sketches, the sketch phase for a couple of different projects, and then the, the sketch phase or for a couple more different projects. So for me, grouping and then staggering, grouping and then staggering is the key to being able to work on more than one goal at once, whether they're um, personal self-initiated projects, uh, those kinds of goals, or if they're uh, client directed projects, those kinds of goals, it, it looks the same once I have, once I have that clear goal identified, the way that I approach it, either way is the same. It's um, yeah, breaking out those tasks that are involved and then grouping together similar tasks. So um, this may be different for, well, it, was de it will definitely be different for different people depending on how their process works. But for me, it's just so helpful to have the, the searching for reference images phase um, to just tackle that in one fell swoop. So I don't have to be going back and forth from like searching for references in one project to, you know, kind of putting on the finishing touches of the watercolor in another project. I have found that every time I make one of those gear shifts, kind of switching into a different mode, it's a different way of thinking. It's a different kind of creativity. It uses different parts of my brain. And I am much less efficient if I'm doing lots of switching between tasks 
and types of tasks. So um, a key element of productivity for me is being able to group those tasks together and you can't really do that if you haven't broken them out. So uh, one other way to think about this, if you haven't gone through a tactical breakdown yet um, and, and pull, kind of pulling out the tasks from a tactic um, or from a project, you could think about just what's your typical process like. So I have a very concrete process that I almost always do. It's some sort of reference image gathering, um, which you know sometimes the client gives me the reference images. That's great when that happens. But even if the client gives them to me, I often will look for other images to kind of supplement, to have additional visual information. Um, but yeah, I almost always have this resource gathering phase. Then there's a kind of an idea phase where I'll do a very rough sketch, then a more um, a detailed sketch that I'm you know, planning to work directly from. And then of course, showing these to the client at each phase. Um, and then uh, the watercolor layer, I pretty much always have a layer of watercolor. And then sometimes I'll work in some other sort of media like gouache or acrylic. So I, I know that I have that sequence in pretty much every piece that I do. So it makes sense for me to group the reference images, to group the sketches. And then I, even when I'm only doing a personal project when I'm or even especially if I'm doing self-initiated work I love having multiple things going at once because if I get sick of working on one I can just immediately switch to another or if I you know if I get a surface of one piece completely saturated in watercolor rather than just sitting around waiting for it to dry I can immediately move on to the next piece I'm already in that frame of mind so diving right into it uh, just makes sense and I get way more done all right that is it for this video next week we are going to tackle the final three points points in my uh, productivity, my seven productivity tips. And those are going to be um, scheduling your tasks. So how to uh, plan your calendar ideally around your task schedule, your task list, um, setting limits, and then writing it all down. So we'll go through all of those. And I'll even unpack a bit of how I do like my, my actual planning, both from a big picture level down to a monthly level and a weekly level and, and even a daily level. So um, we'll go through all of that next week. And uh, if you haven't watched part one yet, go back and do that now. Um, and if you're new here, I can't remember if I introduced myself, but yeah, hi, I'm Kendall Hilligus. <laughs> I'm a full-time freelance illustrator um, and I make videos sharing what I know about freelance illustration. So thank you very much for watching. Um, thank you to Meg for editing this video and especially thank you to my patrons for supporting this channel and making it possible for me to make videos for all of you. So um, that is it and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye! Hey guys, a little bonus for you here at the end. I have a trailer for my new Skillshare class, which is coming out on January 27th and is all about illustration and business. So if you want to see that, then stick around. And uh, if you're all done, then I guess, uh, yeah, have a great week. <laughs> all right, guys, here comes the trailer. Hello, my name is Kendall Hilligus and I'm a full-time freelance illustrator. As a commercial artist, I work with clients large and small on everything from apparel to editorial to packaging. It's taken years, but I've built my business up so that I'm not just surviving as an artist, but thriving. Regularly working with clients like The Wall Street Journal and Real Simple, as well as major national and international food brands. And while it may sound great and look rosy from the outside, it was a long, challenging road to get here. I'm not a natural at all with the art and business stuff. When I graduated from school, I had absolutely no idea how to actually make a career as an artist. I had some basic art skills and I could draw and I was creative, but I didn't really have much direction or clarity beyond that. It took years of painful struggle and figuring things out on my own to turn my passion into a fulfilling career. So if you're in that same boat, if you have some creative and artistic skills and are interested in pursuing art as a vocation where you actually make money, but you're not really sure what to do next or how to turn it into a business, this class is for you. This will be a survey course, which means that we'll have a broad overview of the 10 most important practical businessy things that are often not taught in art school. So we'll tackle everything from the day-to-day -day skills needed to run an art business to the foundational ones needed to build it up, like portfolios, customer service, and finding your niche. So many artists cringe when they hear the word business and thinking about invoices or professional industry standards or marketing makes them want to run and hide their head under a pillow. But I'm here to tell you that it's really not that bad and that building a successful creative career is totally possible. 
In this course, I'll do my best to demystify even the tabooiest of art business subjects so that afterwards you will have a solid foundational overview of some of the most important aspects of running a successful art business. Please keep in mind that we are taking on a lot in this class. So I will cover what I view as the most important vital things to know for getting your art business established, but there will still be more to learn. Since I'm a commercial artist and illustrator myself, this course is specifically geared towards other artists and illustrators. It's also best suited towards people who have a solid grasp on their actual artistic skills and style. So if you're still learning to draw or paint or struggling to find your style, I'd recommend you switch to one of my other classes and focus on your technical artistic skill first before putting too much energy into the business side. There will be plenty of time for that later. But if you're at a more intermediate level and have a fairly consistent developing style and feel ready to start transitioning to working professionally, then let's dive in.